as tax leaders in your organizations. And also, you have to be working to ensure that you can articulate clearly the ways in which your tax department can add value inside and outside of the organization in order for you to remain relevant into the future. Therefore, to help us get ready for the future of tax administration in Nigeria, which the FRS has already begun to implement really, we have curated the content of this webinar to provide that informative and enlightening experience to our participants, just as Amojito said a few minutes earlier. And of course, the discussions are gonna be anchored by our distinguished guest speakers and panelists and ably supported by our KPMG team that have put together this webinar. So on this note, I would like to give a very warm welcome to our guest speakers, Mrs. Chiaka Benobi, Group Lead, Digital and Innovative Support at FRS, and Mr. Soji Abolari, MD West Mestru Limited. A sincere welcome also goes to the Erudite team joining us today for the panel discussions, which include Mr. Imbami Sogmon and Mr. Bilyaminu Aliyu. Um, technology subject matter expert and solution architect at FRS, respectively, and to Mr. Shegun Odebumi, a tax lead at MTN. Also, to our participants, a hearty welcome to you all. We promise that the discussions will be informative and thought provoking, and at the end of the day, it should help you to chat a way forward in equipping your tax function for automated tax administration, which is indeed the future of tax. So on this note, welcome once again, everyone, to this very enlightening webinar put together by KPMG. I ask you to sit back and have an engaging session with us as we open up this webinar. So thank you, everyone, and over to you, um, over to you, Chiri, to help us proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nike, for such a happy welcome address. All right, and I think that sets the tone for the program to start. All right, without much ado, we are going on to our first presentation. But first, like um, Nika has just said, we have uh, about three speakers that will be making three presentations this morning. And the first person will be Adiwale Ajayi, and that will be followed by Soji Abalarin before we'll have the presentation from Mrs. Chaka Benobi. Please join me as I make welcome the first speaker for today's presentation. Adewale Ajayi, partner and head of the Tax, Regulatory and People Services Division of KPMG in Nigeria. Walip, you're welcome. Over to you, please. Thank you so much, uh, Chinyore, and thank you so much, Nike, for that uh, welcome address. Uh, let me just join, add my voice to that, uh, Chinyore and Nike, to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, like she said, um, this promises to be fun, this promises to be engaging, and this promises to be formative. So I'm going to be speaking on how to get ready for the automated tax administration in Nigeria. But just before I start my presentation, I want you to stretch your imagination. Have you ever wondered, you know, a time, you know, when tax authorities, right, to become largely invisible to taxpayers, right? I'm sure that people are saying, you know, how can that be? I also like you to stretch your imagination you know, to a time when, you know, all you have to do, right, is just to get a notification from tax authorities about the tax that is due. In other words, tax will become body free, right? That is the whole essence of what we're saying. You can say, can that happen? But wait a minute, think about the pay system. You know, as an employee, right, you really don't know what is happening, you know, out there. All you know is that your employer has paid your pay tax and you get a notification of how much tax that is due or that has been paid on your behalf, right? That is an example of what is called, you know, a compliance building system, okay? Also, just imagine about cars, you know, flying cars, right? I mean, some of us don't even, you know, I'm sure we've seen some things, you know, what we call dead runner or minority reports where we see cars, you know, flying all over the whole place. Now, Five, ten years ago, there is nothing about uh, self driving car. All we had, you know, were cars that, you know, have to be driven by drivers. But now, if you have a Tesla, right, and it has the full self driving model, you know, you don't really need, you know, to drive anything. All you need to do is to hold your hands, right, and the car drives you to wherever you want to go to, 
right? Because uh, it's already everything is programmed, right? That is what we're talking about here. And what that is saying is that the best way for you to, you know, create your future is to predict it, right? Or the best way, you know, to predict the future, I would say, is to create it. So what we're trying to do is to, you know, is to create our future so that we can predict it. And that is the whole essence of this um, uh, webinar. You know, how do we transform tax? You know, how does tax change from what we know now to what it's going to be, right? Now, but before I start, you know, let me just give like this quotation, you know, from the FRS chair, so that we can draw, you know, um, you know, understand what exactly, you know, automated tax administration is all about, you know, and I want to pay attention to some few uh, phrases in what he said. He talks about, you know, the ease of paying taxes, reducing, you know, you know, the body, you know, that taxpayers, you know, will face when they are paying taxes, right? Making it more efficient, you know, even increasing collections. And of course, we saw the achievement of FRS in 2020 and 2021 and also 2022. So that is what tax promax, you know, has done, right? So that is what the FRS executive chair has done. But let me go straight and talk about the automated tax administration. One thing is clear is that it has become a global agenda. It's not just a Nigerian thing. Every tax authority everywhere in the world is seeking to transform the tax system, right? So the focus you know, has changed over time. And the responsibilities we expect from our tax authorities are also involved, right? So we're seeing the changing tax administration. 10 to 15 years ago, the focus was just on delivering tax revenues. All what governments wanted the tax authorities to do was just to bring revenue so that they can provide services you know, to taxpayers. But we know that times have changed. Every government is bearing, you know, the pressure of revenue of revenue. In Nigeria, for example, we have what we call the revenue challenge, right? I mean, we say the budget 2023, the expected revenue is about 1.5. Please go back to the previous slide. The expected revenue is about 10.5 trillion, right? And we're gonna spend about 22 trillion, leaving a gap of 11 trillion. How do we cover that gap? Right. So the purpose of tax authority has changed from just delivering tax revenue. Now, we've moved to, you know, five to 10 years ago is about risk, right? How do we manage the tax risk? How do we ensure that the tax returns that are submitted by taxpayers are accurate? And how do we ensure that they submit on time? And now when you're talking about tax risk, it's all about the tax gap. And tax gap speaks to the difference between the tax that you expect, you know, to collect and the tax that is actually paid, right? And when you look at um, trends across the world, you see the tax cap, you know, percentage differential between five to ten percent. That means there's so much that can be collected, you know, to reduce, you know, the tax cap, right? And so uh, that is the purpose, you know, reducing the tax cap so that government can have more revenue, you know, to provide services to taxpayer. Again, five years ago, we're not focusing on cost. We're not just interested in collecting revenue. We're not just only interested in ensuring the accuracy and timeliness of the returns that are required. We also saying to ourselves, how do we ensure that the cost of collection is kept to the barest minimum, right? So a lot of efficiency, you know, issues or measures have been introduced by various tax authorities. Tax authorities have adopted e-tax systems. So you can file your tax returns online. You know, there is a concept of e-invoicing. Then of course, there is a concept of the SAFT, which speaks to how, you know, taxpayers and tax authorities can exchange information We've talked about you know automatic exchange of information, country by country reporting, and of course the issue of analytical tools. Tools. Then fast forward, you know, to today. Now the focus is on transparency. It's about we've seen instances where tax authorities are providing you know services to taxpayers. You know, you can go you know online and then you can you know do whatever you want to do you know with your account, right? And you can also have online live chats you know with the tax authorities. Right, but the focus has always been how do you bring taxation you know closer to taxable effects? So, for example, when you look at the concept of company's income tax, company will prepare the return from the beginning of their year to the end of the year, right? And in Nigeria, you have within six months within which you know to submit your tax returns and pay your tax, right? Look at the tax gap. The taxable event occurred between let's say if you take it January to December year, occurred between January to December. 
but taxpayers don't get to pay until June. So that creates a problem, a debt problem, because then the taxpayers may not have the money, you know, to pay tax. So it's not real time, right? So what the tax authorities are trying to do is to bring it closer to when the event happens. The VAT, VAT is more frequent because you only have 31 days within which to pay, right? And then you take returning tax within 21 days. But the whole idea, imagine a situation where as soon as the transaction happens, the tax authorities are able to collect the tax. Right, and that is what the concept of making tax, you know, just happening is all about. How do you ensure that you bring that transition closer to taxable events? Right? How do you ensure that people just you know pay tax without being prompted? When you look at the current system, you know, taxation is hinged on the concept of voluntary compliance, right? But nobody is saying that tax is voluntary. All we're saying is that as taxpayers, you have choices choices. You can choose to comply or you may choose not to comply. You can choose to file, go back to the previous slide please. You can choose to file your return on time, right, or file it late, right? So that is what it's all about. You have choices. But when you go real time, you know, assessment, right, you don't have choices because then the tax authorities are able to take the tax at the time, the, you know, the, the, uh, at the time the transaction occurs. Look at what the FRS has done with the issue of online gaming and lottery, right? So with the deployment of the Sentinel payment to gateway and payment system. So what that does is that as long as the betting is placed, the bet is placed, we take the taxes. And that is where we're going to be moving to, you know, uh, in the future. And that is the future of tax, bringing taxation closer you know, to taxable event. Next slide. Now, what are the drivers, you know, of this automated tax administration? Right. There's so many things that are driving so many factors, right? I mean, first one, of course, is resource constraint. You know, tax authorities don't have all the staff, you know, all the resources that they need to be able to share that with taxpayers. So you've got to find a more efficient way, you know, of doing things, right? And of course, we've also seen instances where tax authorities also have lost staff, right? So when you don't have that many people or that many resources available to you, you've got to find a creative way, you know, of doing things, right? And the other thing, of course, is that we've seen a changing taxpayer behavior, right? I mean, taxpayers don't want to go through the burden of paying taxes. We know that in the world today, especially in Nigeria, paying taxes can be a burden. And if you can imagine a world where paying taxes is burden free, right? That is what we're going to go to. We've seen business models changing, right? We have a lot of businesses that become digital. E commerce is driving the whole process. How do you ensure that you can actually effectively, you know, tax e-commerce, right? And, you know, taxpayers are demanding for improvement in the services, right, that tax authorities provide, right? And, of course, we've seen the issue of globalization. So these are some of the factors, you know, that are chipping, you know, automated tax administration in the world. Now, next slide, please. So when you look at the changing you know, face of tax administration. There are two benefits that I can see from tax authorities and from taxpayers. From tax authorities, what we're saying is, of course, is increased collection, as you can see from the case studies, you know, on the screen, right? It helps to improve tax collection. And of course, there is also benefit for the taxpayer. Taxpayer also have seen the reduction in the cost of compliance, right? You know, they don't have to go through, you know, all sort of, you know, keeping all sort of manual records that are, costly, that are laborious and manual. So records have been kept in a digital form. And what that has done is that it has helped to eliminate, you know, tax fraud incidents in some instances. So there are benefits that will accrue to tax authorities and there are benefits that accrue to taxpayers also. Next slide. So next slide. So what you have on the screen is showing the history, the timeline, you know, as to how tax administration has evolved in Nigeria especially when you're talking about automated process. You know, starting in, in you know from twenty thirteen, when the Federal Revenue Service introduced the concept of the integrated tax administration system. Right. And then we'll move on, you know, to some other years. You know, you can see it across the line to twenty twenty one when tax promise, you know, was introduced. And like as you saw in the prefix that I showed, it has helped revenue, you know, the tax authorities to collect, you know, more revenue. And you've also seen some tax state authorities also automating the tax process. Okay, and so what we're going to see is that a lot of the tax authorities in Nigeria, you know, are going to automate the tax process because that is the way to go.
that is the nature of tax. And so, of course, the question is, if tax authorities are automating their processes, you as a taxpayer, what are you doing, you know, to keep pace? Are you going to be playing catch-up, right? Hopefully, you know, at the end of this uh, webinar, you will understand, you know, what you need to do, right, so that you can catch up, you know, with the tax authorities. And currently, you know, in December, the chairman of the FRS announced that you can easily now process your business. All you need to do is to, is to do is to go to that format, look for the icon of process business. Once you click on it, if you don't have any tax uh, liability, you generate your TCC. So unlike before, where you still have to, you know, go through the process of filling the form, to, you know, and then generate your TCC. So the future of tax is changing. And we're seeing a lot of tax authorities, you know, evolving, you know, in that regard. So if the future of tax is changing, let's like this. Now, the key issue is how ready are you, right? And so what's the objective of automated tax administration? The whole objective or the whole essence is to make tax digital. And of course, the question is, what does that mean, making tax digital? First means, you know, to make tax digital means you must keep digital records. Then number two, it means that you must keep, you know, you must adopt a software that can actually integrate with that of FRS tax format you know, for you to submit the tax returns. That is what it is all about, right? So, um, and for you to do that, there are certain questions that you need to consider, you know, for that to happen. The first question you need to ask yourself is, you know, is your comp as your company embedded tax technology and is overall tax strategy, right, as approved by the board? Or maybe another question might be, do you even have a tax strategy in the first instance? So if you don't have a tax strategy, so you cannot likely have, you know, a tax technology strategy. So you have to start thinking, you know, about that. The next question you need to ask yourself is whether your current infrastructure is even sufficient enough to address you know, your needs, whether in terms of the resources that you have, in terms of the people, you know, will it be sufficient for you to be able you know, to automate you know, your process and to be able to align with the transformation agenda of the tax authorities? And of course, the other thing, the third question you need to ask yourself is, how about the quality of the data that's generated by your accounting system? Can you please rely on on it. Are you aware or are you confident that the number being generated by your system is accurate? And of course, it's a question about security, about trust, you know, you know, about your IT management framework, you know, around the FRS automation agenda. How do you ensure that privacy is protected? Right? So those are questions that you need, you know, to start asking yourself. And you have to start asking yourself what kind of software do you deploy? Are you going to deploy a software that just keep records? Or are you going to have a software that can actually bridge, that can interface with that of the tax programs? You know? And so the next, once we consider this question, I guess what you want to know is, how do I respond you know, to these questions? And that is what the next slide is speaking to. Next slide. Now, how do you respond to the questions that are posed in the previous slide? I think the very first thing that is very important is for you to conduct a readiness assessment. Right? You know, how ready are you? So you need to start from your current your current situation, do a current assessment of what you have, and then determine where you want to be, right? And then determine what resources that you need to get to where you want to be. It's a journey, right? And of course, you need to rethink your compliance strategy to include digital reporting. One of the days when you have to be able to do you know manual, do everything manually. I mean, you can look at you know the time that is that that is required. And of course, you also have to determine, you know, where help is required. Do you want to insource? Do you want to outsource? Right? And of course, you've got to develop, you know, an implementation roadmap. Next slide. Which is my last slide. What you have on the screen today, or on the screen showing now, shows you how your journey will start. Now, if you're going to embark on a tax automation journey, where will it be? You know, you start from where you are today on the left to where you want to be on the right, right? And these are the factors that you look at, the seven factors. You have to look at the issue of governance and risk, organization, your people, process and responsibility, data and information, right? So, I mean, the systems and technology, performance management. So you can look at the journey and ask yourself, where are you, you know, in this spectrum? You know, this is what you need to be able to automate your process, right? If there's one takeaway that you can get from this uh, presentation, is that technology has now become a requirement for you to fulfill 
your physical obligations. If you don't have technology, a time will come when you will not be able to submit your returns. A time will come when you will not be able to process anything because everybody is going digital. And so the question is, are you going to be proactive or are you going to be reactive? That is the question that you need to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Wally, for such an educative and enlightening session. Okay, we'll be going to the next presentation immediately. Um, please join me as I make welcome Mr. Soji Abalarin. Mr. Soji Abalarin is the Managing Director of West Metro Limited, one of the consultants that have been working with FRS. Mr. Soji, you're welcome. Thank you very much and good morning. Can we get the slides up, please? Thank you. So first slide. So as Wally had mentioned earlier on, um, I'll start with what the issues are. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so as he had mentioned, what is the VAT gap? The VAT gap is the difference between what is expected to be collected and what is actually collected. And um, as at the last time uh, research was done, um, the VAT gap in Nigeria in 2018 was at about 72%. Um, that is very alarming. It means that over about 72 percent of revenues that are should accrue to the government through VAT is not being remitted. Um, obviously, this has this has improved over the last year, the last two years, especially with the introduction of tax pro max. And you know, as I go further, you see how tax pro max too has been able to um, be able to help us reduce that VAT gap. But the question now becomes: Why? What are the reasons for this um, VAT gap? Um, primary reason under reporting. Uh, poor understanding of how VAT works. Um, if you ask me personally, the introduction of the 25 million naira limit, because SMEs now um, have absorbed themselves from even either filing, um, reporting taxes, especially when there's a possibility that be end, before the end of that financial year, they might uh, pass that 25 million naira limit. Um, there's the issue of the collections gap, a number of tax agents operating outside of the tax net. Uh, they just set up businesses and, you know, hope and pray that FIRS catches up or does not catch up. Um, we have registered businesses, especially in the um, sector like hospitality sector, who are operating with a different brand name that is different from um, the registered business name. So this is makes, it, makes it significantly harder for the tax authorities to be able to keep track of such people. If you have a brand name called Mr. Small and the registered business name is West Metro Limited, you know, by just doing your normal monitoring rounds, it gets more difficult for you to be able to identify who is in the tax net. We have branch management. Of course, it's people just wake up, you know, own new branches without informing the tax authority. I might have started a business in, in Abuja and then decided to expand to Lagos or Shun states and other states. And as I'm opening these branches, because my tax file is in Abuja, you know, um, there is almost no visibility to the branches at the, at the, at the state level. Um, we have the quality of records during retrospective audits. Um, a lot of people would agree that by the time you're going three, four, five, six months, one year after facts, just to go and do an audit, then even the information you need, POS receipts, the printer, the ink on the printer fades very quickly. So you find out that there's actually no completeness in the records that are given. So when you ask them for these receipts, um, they're just going to give you a bunch of papers and, you know, chances are a lot of these papers are actually faded, you know. And then, of course, we have um, issuance of banking instruments like POS systems to personal individual accounts. Um, you go into a, an establishment, you pay with your card, yes, but that card is not tied to a business account, which requires a tax identification number. It's tied to a personal individual's account. And then, of course, we have um, lack of software solutions. Of course, as Wally had said earlier on, um, you need to determine what, um, what level of technology your organization needs. So if you're in the retail space, what type of software are you using? What are the software are you using for your accounting? What kind of software are you using for property, property management? What type of software are you using for your enterprise resource planning? So those questions and those kind of things are the reasons why we have such a, a huge gap in terms of the uh, facts. Can we get the next slide, please? Good. So in order to address this, um, countries around the world are moving towards what we know as continuous transaction controls. I mean, you would have heard about automation multiple times, you would have heard of fiscalization, you would have heard of invoicing, but what are these things? Um, CTC or continuous transaction controls 
are not necessarily only technology, but a set of processes, legal and technology, that allows governments to be able to view transactions in real time. So as you are coming, as you as two people are doing a business transaction, the third party, who is the government, who has the tax collect at that point in time, also knows that this transaction has occurred. So after the facts, there is no need for either party to chase um, any of the other parties for, for example, um, a receipt from FIRS, credit notes or whatnot. Now, under um, CTC, we, are, we have two things. One is called electronic invoicing and one is called fiscalization. Um, electronic invoicing, as the name suggests, is, suggests is really the issuance of um, electronic invoices, but it doesn't stop at that. Just issuing an electronic invoice doesn't necessarily mean that you are doing invoicing. From the beginning of the transaction, which is when you've issued a quotation to when the invoice is created to when you now actually register the payment down to when the products are actually shipped, all these things come under electronic invoices. So we're looking at all the documents that a business might have to use to complete transactions. And what does it mean? For example, sometimes you could issue a quotation to a third party. The quotation, the, the, the third party also needs to know that, oh, okay, um, this invoice you've issued to me it includes VAT, includes withholding tax. I need to ensure that this is a taxable invoice that is in line with the standards of the tax authority. And this is what allows for business to business transactions. Whereas fiscalization is for um, retail transactions. So what we've done in Nigeria so far. We've seen um, since about 2016, we've seen Lagos states introduce their own laws on, on fiscalization. We've seen that prior to fiscalization born in the retail sector, and we're also doing that in the hospitality um, sector. So fiscalization, like the name, like it says here, is not just, um, it's also the legal framework. So if you look at Lagos states um, fiscalization law, the hotel occupancy law, it's a very detailed and probably the most detailed fiscalization law we have in Nigeria. It speaks specifically to how receipts, that is the final receipt issued to the final customer is, um, it must be issued. Why is this important? At the end of the day, in a B2B transaction, it's between two businesses. So you find out that one of the two parties, which is the one that is VAT, that is paying the VAT or is having his tax withheld, would always chase the other person to give him the evidence of the transaction. However, in retail transactions, the final customer who is the person paying the VAT, me, consuming the products, doesn't necessarily get this. You just get a bill, pay 100,000 naira with the VAT included, and you walk away. Fiscalization changes this completely, and this also helps to close the back gap because the format in which receipts are now issued is now determined, and the taxpayer who is paying for the VAT now has evidence that this particular receipt has been reported to FIRS. Can we move to the next slide, please? So the journey so far, where have we started? As about 2016, 2017, Lagos State um, rolled out its own fiscalization act um, to cover for the consumption tax and hotels, restaurants. And um, the model they used then was, was to put um, electronic fiscal uh, devices for the hospitality sector. Um, that project is still ongoing to the best of my knowledge and was, um, there was a lot of resistance to it. Um, FIRS has also done virtual fiscal devices in the retail sector. Um, and then of course we have what we call software fiscalization, API connection for the hospitality sector. Now, from then to now, because the regulations surrounding how this project should work out are just being developed. So they've always been, there's been a natural resistance but we are here today, we have the Finance Act. We have the necessary parts of the law, the Finance Act that gives FIRS the right to automate. Uh, but beyond that, we must still understand, you know, what are the issues that customers face and what are the things that customers say, you know, their concerns are. Cybersecurity, the threat to hacking, system compatibility, which is installation of any type of third party device on their system. And of course, data privacy, the threat to personal proprietary and customer data. Um, these are all valid concerns, and I'll speak to them very quickly. In terms of cybersecurity, it is very, very, I mean, while in the digital world, it means that the more you bring out digital systems, the more the risk to your organization becomes. Of course, in terms of security, we are all familiar with what is called business um, compromised emails, among other types of threats, phishing, vision, and whatnot. Of course, adding this level of automation also exposes 
um, customers to a different level of risk. So the question now becomes, how do we, as uh, FIS or as West Metro or third party consultants, help to assure the taxpaying public that cybersecurity has been handled? System compatibility. Um, of course, installation of electronic visual, fiscal devices or virtual fiscal devices would definitely run into issues um, over time due to the way different systems are configured. So the question now becomes, how do we ensure that um, this is handled? And of course, software uh, and then data privacy, how do we ensure that the right, the, the specific right data is being sent to FRS and not any type of personal identifiable information um, being pulled out of the system? Let me have the next slide, please. Good. Now, for us to do that, um, we have a system called the ATRS, and that's what we've used for FRS in the hospitality sector, and that's what I can speak to. Now, for us, the process is very simple. Um, of course, by law, FRS is required to write to you as a tax agent to inform you and give you 30 days to comply. And all you need to do to comply is to sign up on the eCitizen platform, which is where which is, this is the taxpayer's dashboard. So that's the, the tax agent individual dashboard where they can find their own um, transactions and register their devices. Now, most importantly, for them to complete the connection to FIRS, FIRS doesn't visit your premises or install anything. All you need to do is to contact your software vendor. Now, what does this mean? Already, we have most of the softwares that are used in accounting processes, in property management, points of sale, and ERP have already created their own integration to the FIRS interface. So as opposed to FIRS coming to say, I'm coming to install a device on your existing system, you need to just talk to that your existing software vendor who has or might have completed the integration to provide the integration on your behalf. So for example, if you use SAP or you use Odoo or you use Oracle, for example, you need to just talk to Oracle and they will provide the interface on your behalf. Of course, there's the penalties for non-compliance, which is, I think, on the first day, 50,000 naira and 25,000 naira subsequently. But um, obviously, the FIS has the, um, the prerogative to determine who they want to send this fine to, so far there's a level of compliance. So it's very simple. If we go back to the previous slide, we see that the issues of cybersecurity, data privacy are easily addressed through this model. Why? It's fair enough for you not to trust governments. It's also fair enough for you not to trust an agent of government who happens to be West Metro. However, you already have a software vendor who, has, who you already trust and has provided your technology for you, has deployed and integrated. You don't have to take our word for it. You need to take the word of that software vendor who has built the interface on your behalf. They are the ones that will give you the level of assurance that you need and require that lets you know that, look, this is the information that is being sent to FIRS. No FRS staff is coming to your office to install any device. Nobody or no FRS agent is coming to do anything. No. It is only between you, the software vendor, and the tax agent that you can decide to do your deployment and your, and your confirmation. So this goes back to the topic of self-compliance. Nigeria is a self-compliance regime. As in as much as um, audits and other processes have been put in place to say, this is how much you have to declare. You still have to go yourself to say that this is how much I've made. So the same thing goes with the automation. You won't expect anybody to come and force you to install anything on your device. You just go for um, a compliant software. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So how does it work? The moment you have completed that integration, talk to your software vendor. The moment you issue a receipt, and this is where I will talk about the Finance Act and revenue recognition, um, vast recognition of cash basis. Kiteru, you would always have to re recognize your VAT on a accrual basis, but that the Finance Act says that, look, you can recognize it on cash basis. So if, for example, someone has bought something for you and you've raised um, on your points of sale or your invoice, that transaction continues to age up until the time where you receive the money for that transaction. Because at that time you go to your system and you now register a payment to say, I have received the money from this transaction and as such, I'm recognizing the VAT. It is at that very moment that the transaction is also reported to FIRS. So you ask yourself, how do I even take advantage of cash basis on VAT transaction? It's just through automation. So the moment the, the, the transaction is registered as paid, the transaction is sent to FIRS. FIRS now sends its own response back to the point of sale system. 
and the receipt is printed. So if you look to the right of the screen, you will see an example of what the receipt looks like. And if you just scan the QR code on the page, it takes you to the payment verification page. So as you mean, were a customer, you walked into any hotel or restaurant and you know you spend so much money. And of course, they're giving you the VAT. You're upset, oh, why am I paying so much for VAT? You know, at least now you have the evidence. By simply bringing out your phone and scanning the QR code, you are now told that this is an original receipt and you can be 100% assured that at the end of the period that that transaction is going to be reported to, is already reported to FIRS and by the 21st of the next month, um, the VAT will be remitted. Next slide, please. Okay, so data privacy and protection. Like I said earlier on, you don't have to take our word for it. But in terms, FIS now, you know, we've explained that FIS is not coming to install anything in your system. FIS is not pulling anything from your system. It is your system that reports your taxable transactions to FIRS when revenue is recognized. Now, what data is being sent to FIRS? These are all the data sets, the tax identification number, the business place and device in case you have branches and you have multiple tills, the time and the date of the transaction, the bill number, the amount of the transaction without taxes, the total amount of the transaction with taxes, the payment type, the currency, the security code, and the tax rates. As you can see, no, no other field exists on the API for FIRS. So even if any other type of data even wants to be sent, there is no capability on the FIRS side to receive it. We are simply strictly interested in the information of the transaction and the details of those transactions. I bought a bottle of water. We know that okay, it's a bottle of water that you bought. This is the time you bought the water. This is the place you bought the water. And this is the bath that accrues to the water, if bath accrues to the water, depending on where you buy it. Um, of course, to go further in terms of data privacy and protection, FIRS is ISO 27001 certified. These certifications are done by, by ISO International Firm. And in fact, when it comes to the audit itself, um, somebody flies into Nigeria, conducts the audits, and issues a certification. I'm also aware that FIRS is also NDPR um, compliant. I know that audit has been conduct conducted. So when we talk about uh, managing your data, um, tax data, of course, tax data is very, very confidential. It's, it didn't just happen now. It has always been so in the past. But now that we're moving towards automation, the general public needs to understand that all the things that are required, even from the FIRS side, to ensure that the environment is fully secure and whatever transactional information that is being sent is also treated as such is already available. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are the softwares you can use? And this is just a few of them. A lot more have been integrated, um, but your popular ones, ones you are very used to, SAP, Oracle, QuickBooks, EPOS, you know, Microsoft Dynamics. By the time you go to any of these stores, you know, you can easily just get the plugin and do your self-compliance yourself, or you talk to your software vendor to do it for you. Next slide, please. And of course, these are some of the companies that have already come online using this model. Um, none of them had any third party, and it gives you a level of assurance. You know, when you have hotels like the Hilton, um, the Marriott, Fraser, uh, Fraser Suits, ABB, you know, these are companies that did not at any point in time visit FIRS or have FIRS visit them, but they were able to work with their software vendors to complete the integration on their behalf. And they're all fully online and compliant with the FIRS um, automation today. Next slide, please. Next. Okay, so pretty much um, this is the end of my own presentation, I'm out of time. And if you have any other questions, you can put it in the group and then we'll answer. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Saji, for that succinct presentation. And I must say that you actually addressed quite a lot of issues that I know must be, you know, talking at the heart of a good number of participants. Thank you so very much for that presentation. We are much better for it. All right, okay, so, so far we've had two presentations. The first one was done by Adewale Ajayi, and we just listened to um, Soji Abalarin as well. Um, one of the things that I took away from um, Mr. Waliza, um, presentation was, first of all, it started from the government, the need of revenue by the government, and then moved to the tax administrator, the FRS, why they're doing what they're doing. And then for us, the taxpayers, what we are required to do. And then now we've had a subject expert, Mr. Soji, who have taken us through the technology part, the technical part of 
the whole automation process of the tax authorities. And I, I think it's been such a wonderful session so far. So please, I know that there may be some questions you still want to ask. Please remember to drop the questions in the Q&A box. All right, so the next session will be go having a poll session right now, like I mentioned in, um, initially, we'll have to, but the first one will be coming up right away. And on the screen, um, we'll have the QR code that you can scan. Just use the camera of your phone to scan the code. It will take you directly to where the questions are. Or you can use the link that will be dropped, that's been dropped now on the chat box. That will also take you to the question. Or you can go to slido.com and type in the seven digits and it will also take you to the question. All right, so please let's join. Let's join. Okay. All right. Okay, so we have the first question. The automated tax initiatives introduced by various tax authorities in Nigeria have made tax compliance easier, faster, and cheaper. Wow, 70% strongly agree. Okay, still changing, still changing. Okay. So far, we have over 80% of our participants in the agree category. All right. So a good number of us agree that the process has made compliance easier, faster, and cheaper. Okay. All right. Let's move to the second question, please. Can the transaction data generated from your organization's accounting or enterprise resource planning system be submitted to the tax authorities directly without additional review? Yes or no? Okay, over 60% said no. So additional work needs to be done on the data generated from the system. Okay, all right. The third question, please. If the data cannot be directly submitted to the tax authorities, what level of additional review is required? Wow. 54% moderate review, 35 significant, and 10% minimal. Okay. All right. So we'll move to the last question now. What is your company's current sourcing strategy for all tax work? Full outsourcing, full insourcing, co sourcing? A combination of insourcing and outsourcing. Oh. 
over 70 percent says co-sourcing Twenty-one percent, twenty percent full insourcing, nine percent full outsourcing, but we still have over seventy percent saying that they do co-sourcing. All right, okay. Thank you, everyone, for your participation so far. And that brings us to the third and the last presentation for the day, which will be done by Mrs. Chaka Benobi, the Group Lead Digital and Innovation Support Group of the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Please join me as I welcome Mrs. Chaka Benobi. You're welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Chinyari. Can you hear me? Very well, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. We can. Thank you very much. I'm happy and honored you. to be here. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You are controlling the slides, right? Yes, I am. Okay. So you let me know where you want me to start. Your slides are on, ma. Okay, thank you very much. I see that we have uh, 520 participants. Um, thank you. I've been introduced. My name is Chiaka Benobi. I'm the Group Lead Digital and Innovation Support Group. KPMG has directed me to make a presentation on how we are enhancing SaaS compliance through technology in FRS. So this presentation is to share with you the FRS experience. The outline of my presentation, the next slide, please. Am I controlling this slide or are you doing that? I'm doing the, that. The, you are doing or I'm doing? No, I am doing that. I'm controlling okay. it. All right then. The outline of my presentation is to first of all start by what actually do we mean by technology in enabling um, compliance. We, and that for us, it's um, automation. So I'm starting by giving a brief description of what automation means to us before I start sharing the FRS experience. I will start from the beginning, um, before we started automation, what and what were the drivers and what exactly were we doing and how we have fed with what we started with um, as far back as um, 2004, 2006. I would then share the journey in years, beginning from that um, 2004, and then the automation initiatives that we had deployed with particular reference to tax administration. Since this presentation is talking about um, tax administration, we have limited it to, I have limited the presentation to discussing the, tax administration automation, leaving out the internal processes, even though they all work hand in hand to give us the efficiency that we are seeing today. I'll then have a, a brief touch on the impact of the um, technologies we have deployed on collection and other areas of the service, what the pros and cons have been for us, the challenges, and then what the future looks for us. Um, I know there must be a lot of interest on what we are doing with tax pro max, so I'll give a high level roadmap on what we'll be doing today or what we'll be doing this year with uh, tax pro max and then a brief conclusion. So um, starting with uh, our definition of uh, what exactly do we mean when we say automation. We say um, automation technology is simply a new, uh, is simply a realignment. It's um, a new investment on, um, on initiatives, business models, re-engineering our processes, especially to position us to be able to compete in the ever-changing digital world that we're beginning to experience and experiencing. 
These are changes in rapid advancement in technology, which has also led to an enhancement of connectivity, inclusion, customer expectations, which is putting pressure on businesses to deliver real time. So as a result, tax administration are also employing technology so as to match what the businesses are doing and also to drive um, compliance and to give us a better taxpayer experience. It's also to protect and sustain our tax base so as to reduce the administrative burdens. So going to what um, the drivers, um, well, this simply said that we have an undergoing um, technological transformation to tackle the needs of the ever-changing businesses. By first of all, re-engineering our processes so as to improve um, taxpayer experiences and increase revenue generation, which really is the ultimate economic development of Nigeria. So the next slide captures um, where we are coming from, from when we started the reform in FIRA, from reform to modernization, and then now to digital transformation of where we are. First and foremost, FIRS um, embarked on the modernization program in 2004. They identified the, we identified the drivers for the modernization program and then how each one of these impacted on what we called the seven strategic flanks. The drivers is on the left of the screen, which is um, encouraging voluntary compliance. Um, incidentally, is the theme of my presentation. Reduce over dependence and reliance on oil, expand the tax net, also um, reorientate the staff to have a positive uh, change attitude, improve, improve service delivery, eliminate corruption, and ultimately increase the government's revenue profile. How did this then, um, how did we put this together to come up with the seven strategic flanks? What we identified that is seven strategic flanks then was first um, to audit oil, gas, and large sector tax players. And on the right, you see that I have um, put also, I have, um, um, included a column which we called, uh, which I call the status column. So for each of these strategic flanks, the status column is telling us where we are with regards to implementing that particular strategy. On auditing oil, gas, and large tax um, um, players, I say this is ongoing. It is um, work in progress. So that as long as the tax administration exists, auditing will be part of. Um, um, tax administration. However, our intention in driving compliance is to reduce it to the minimal um, to the minimal level, where the number of um, companies that will be selected for audit purposes will reduce them um, significantly. The next on the strategic flanks is to re-engineer and automate our internal. Okay, the next term um, on our strategic flanks is to re-engineer re our internal processes, such as our um, HR, to re-engineer and automate, such as our HR processes, finance and procurement. And the status of that today is that this has been achieved. The FIRS HR finance and procurement functions is running on um, SAP and it's operational. Then it's the building capacity for staff, and structure staffing and then create specializations. Um, we all know that um, many of us probably are aware that um, FRS have um, eight career paths built along, um, developed along specialization. 
We have the finance um, career paths. We have project management career paths. We also have the tax career path. Why was this taken as a strategy? Because we found out, or what was found out then, that you may at some point have a finance specialist running the project management office. So the management, as at that time, thought that to build specialization where we we'll have expertise running each of the functions. So there are eight career paths today in FIRS where those that are specialized in each of those um, um, functions are actually running the function or staffing those functions. And how have we felt today? First, there is the dedicated department, which we call career skills um, development, that is um, focused on uh, capacity building for staff. They run uh, online courses, they run virtual um, trainings, as well as classroom trainings, and each staff of FIRS is entitled to being in two professional organizations. They attend um, the uh, um, professional um, organize the annual events, they attend their workshop, and it's all catered for by FRS, you know, encouraging us to deepen and uh, improve on our specialized areas. So, and then there's a global training plan for the service that's uh, for the entire organization, which um, takes about 70% of the budgeted uh, funding for training. The other 30% is then left with the department to organize their own specialized and focused training for the staff. In addition to that, we run what we call technical sessions every month, where um, the focus is on uh, personal development. And in some cases, we do have um, uh, technical training during those uh, sessions. And especially for those that are uh, just coming into the department to also understand how things work and they can then leverage on the experience of the more senior and older staff. The next on the strategy, which is the fourth one, is to re-engineer and automate collections um, through tax administration system. We are aware our first try on ITAS, um, we did not work very well in meeting our requirements, which then um, uh, was what um, triggered the current administration to, to um, get internal staff to develop uh, an in-house an in-house uh, tax administration solution, over which is tax format. Over and above this, we are also automating different sectors for VAT collection, withholding tax from source, as well as uh, stamp duty. Provide taxpayer education. We're making good use of the of the social media platform in engaging them. Um, the taxpayers. Strengthening investigation and enforcement has been restructured for efficiency. For all our tax offices, there is an investigation as well as enforcement um, function. And then funding FIRS will have a 4% cost of non-oil collection appropriated by National Assembly. Now, given the journey in years, how we have fared, I have boxed uh, the years from 2002 to 2004 up till 2024. So most of what I have mentioned um, in the earlier slides are captured in this slide. It's just showing how the journey has been in the last um, in the last years, beginning from 2002. However, where we are currently is looking at the digital transformation plan, which is consolidating all the successes of the past and moving us to the digital transformation um, era. And then um, that's what we'll be working now with all of its. Um, processes and technology interventions, which is required to support the service uh, business objectives. Still sharing the FRS experience, um, um, the automation initiatives that we had uh, deployed for tax administration. First is the e-services for registration, including um, non-resident taxpayers, e-filing, e-payments, issuance of receipts and withholding credit notes and credits, uh, withholding credits, stamp duty, task clearance, and then utilization, e-utilization of the withholding credits. We've, just, we've already discussed about the e-payment. We have the channels as um, InterSwitch e-transact, and then we we'll also provide them um, online payments from these channels. We we'll also have the option of going to the bank to pay. 
The VA2 automation program for specialized sectors will have the financial services, hospitality, branded retail outlets like um, um, shop rights, cable and satellite TV as well. Then for collaboration and um, integration with third party databases, we have with the 36 states of JTB. We also have with uh, some MDAs that um, like CAC, Customs, CBN, Federal Ministry of Trade, as well as uh, financial institutions and then um, um, OECD countries. Like I earlier mentioned, we are also engaging um, with social media, with the taxpayers and giving online real-time information to taxpayers. Now let's look at the impacts automation has done from to FIRS. We'll observe from the slide that uh, beginning from 2015, uh, when FIRS started deploying most of its um, tax administration solutions, there has been less dependence on oil revenue, on revenue from oil to non-oil. And this was only made possible uh, by the deployment of technology um, to the non-oil sector. As at this last year, ended 2022, December 31, with a collection of 10 trillion and 51 billion for 5.9, that's almost 6 trillion is attributed to non-oil collection. Perhaps we can have a look at that slide uh, and see how that has been progressing since uh, 2015. The last time that uh, oil collection beat non-oil collection was in 2014. The other areas that um, technology has impacted includes uh, the convenience to taxpayers. I happen to have seen um, the question and answer session where about 80% of the participants do agree that uh, the deployment of technology has actually sold convenience to taxpayers. And that includes service delivery, increase in generation from last year 6.4 trillion to, no, from 2021, 6.4 trillion to 2022, 10.051 trillion. I think that's a huge lead. That's about 66% increase from the 2021 collection. I would like to jump the pros and cons of automation, some of which we do know um, really improve the um, employee productivity, connection, better customer experience. And then the cons really has been an adoption. It's one thing to deploy technology, it's another to get people to use them. Um, so that has been some of the cons that uh, we're experiencing. And again, on digital security, we realize that we have to make a lot of investment to protect the data of our taxpayers and also to protect the system from being hacked by those who are probably not meaning well. And then some of the challenges again has been the resistance to change, not just internal but also external. There's been, there was a low adoption until enforcement started. There's also the continuous evolution of um, needs and legislation and policies. We then have to also make us to go back and begin to reconfigure or reject the system. Now let's look at um, what automation means for FIRS now and the future states. First, um, the FIRS, current FIRS management defined the four cardinal um, goals for technological drive. So whatever it is that we're doing in the service today is, is focused and geared towards achieving these four cardinal goals. First is rebuilding FIRS institutional framework. Next is the customer centric, making the taxpayers, um, giving the uh, taxpayers positive experience, collaborating with um, other stakeholders, like I have also highlighted in the previous slides, and also building a data centric um, organization. We want to get to the point where you really do not have to go to the taxpayers' offices or their locations to be able to um, get the information that you require. Um, you'll be able to match information um, that you need from different sources and profile a taxpayer. Um, so for us to achieve that, we have also identified specific strategies that will be um, driving our achievement of the four cardinal goals. We realized that um, technology itself would not change behavior. So implementing these specific strategies will assist FIRS in achieving the four cardinal goals. One is that we have to also review the tax laws and legislations. 
Um, some of them are archaic. They do not align with the current trends, especially with the digital economy. We have to intensify collaboration with um, stakeholders. Um, like already stated, we want to be um, taxpayer centric. We'll also target uh, programs for large and medium taxpayers and not um, um, just uh, send out one message that fits all. Uh, we'll expand our tax treaty. We're already doing that with OECD countries and then uh, continuously improve in FRS structure so as to align with the ever-changing business world. Then improve capacity and standardize VAT compliance program. The roadmap for um, tax pro max for 2023. In quarter one, we, we did say from last year when we did this uh, roadmap, we will automate tax clearance certificates, which um, um, has been done um, just this year alone, where today is the, is the 17th of um, January. We've already issued uh, over a thousand tax clearance on this platform using the automatic uh, tax clearance certificates. And then we are going to deploy the tax audit and investigation module where you will not see FIRS staff going to the tax offices for tax audits um, and investigation. We will do at least the primary um, uh, processes that we need to run from the offices and present our findings to the taxpayer. We're also automating the input VAT claims. We're also integrating the sectoral VAT automation um, that uh, we currently have operationalized um, already. And this will all happen in this quarter one from January to March. The first, the TCC and the audit and the investigation module have completed. They've gone through UAT, it's just to deploy. By second quarter, we aim to um, having a self-service uh, taxpayer registration. We'll implement the PPT module. The PPT module will also come the foreign payments and then we will reintegrate uh, with GIFNIS. There was um, changes in the GIFNIS platform, which also affected our um, integration with them. But this uh, we're working on, so then we do in real time, um, real time integration with them. We'll complete our third party integration by the third quarter. And then by the fourth quarter, we're looking at business and intelligence analytics. analytics. We're supporting all this, um, this roadmap by continuous user support, achieving stabilization. And of course, we don't forget change management and its importance. In conclusion, therefore, I would say that um, the path to successful automation in um, public sector is complex sometimes requiring legislative support. However, um, MDA should not shy away because the future as we know it today is technology. And again, um, there is a, a lot of uh, body of knowledge um, that um, MDAs can leverage on to achieve their objective. Technological advances for government systems present opportunities, not just for the government, but also for the citizens. It is a key business enabler and the cornerstone of any nation's development. Thus, adoption is key. So while um, doing the, while implementing the technology, we must not forget the impact of change management because the technology is only dealing with the technical aspect of what we want to achieve, but the real um, change and the real achievement is on changing behavior. And that changing behavior is not on the technology, it's with the people. I think uh, more often than not, we tend to neglect the people aspect to these changes that we are driving. So I would say that it may be too much to imagine a future where people enjoy paying taxes. However, we believe in FRS what that is that with the implementation of the FRS four cardinal goals and the digital transformation strategy, FRS is imagining a future in which the experience of paying taxes we become virtually painless. So that would be the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ma, for that wonderful presentation. I thank you for taking us through the FRS uh, digital transformation journey. We started all the way back from 2000, 2004. Thank you so very much. Thank you. All right, with that said,
um, we'll be going into the next, the second and the last post session for this event. Um, the QR code is on the screen. Please will appreciate your participation. Use your camera phone to scan the code, or you can use the link that is in the chat box to assess the questions. Or you can go to slido.com and use the seven digit numbers on the screen to get to the questions. All right, please join us. Can use the QR code, the link in the chat box, or you can go to slider.com. Okay. So the first question that we have in this second session says, does the organization have tax technology tools and automated processes to support the FRS tax automation agenda? Okay. Keep the responses coming. Okay. Please keep it coming. Oh, 50 50. Okay. All right. Okay. Our next question. If your organization has automated tax process, how would you describe the level of automation? High, moderate, low, non-existent. Okay. Moderate. Okay, over 100 responses. And the highest response says moderate, over 40%. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for your participation so far. So we'll go to our next question. Does your organization have a formal tax policy or tax risk management framework? Okay. All right. Okay. The next question, it says, if your organization has a formal tax policy or tax risk management framework, does it include a strategy for the adoption of technology solution and automation? Please keep the responses coming. Okay. Okay. Okay, over a hundred response so far. All right, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Almost sixty percent said yes. Okay. Thank you so very much, everyone, for your responses so far. Okay, and with that done, 
um, it's time for us to go to another power packed session of this program. And that is the panel session. And that panel session will be anchored by Aminat Chegede, Associate Director in Tax Regulatory and People Services Division of KPMG Nigeria. The topic for the panel section or the panel session will focus on expectations and challenges of automated tax administration. Please join me as I welcome Aminat Chegede. Thank you very Thank you much, Shinyiri, for the warm, warm welcome. Okay, thank you, our participants, for staying with us for the last one hour and 20 minutes. I think now, I haven't listened to Wale, Mr. Soji Apolari, and Mrs. Chiaka Benobi. It is no longer news. The organizations need to take active steps to automate their tax function and be ready for tax technology transformation. So in the next 25 minutes, we'll be discussing the expectations and challenges of automated tax administration. And to do that, I'll be joined by subject matter experts in the person of Mr. Biliami Noaliyu, who is the project manager and solution architect of Tax Promax at the FIRS. Also, we'll be joined by Mr. Shegun Odebunyi, a senior manager tax at MTN. We'll also have Mr. Mbami Shogwam, a subject matter expert at FIRS's Automated Tax Administration Solution. We'll also have our very own Ulufemi Babem, who is the partner and tax reimagined lead in KPMG. And lastly, we'll be inviting Mr. Soji Abolari, the MD West Mestro limited to also help our participants to channel you know the expectations of some of the challenges of automated tax administration mr bolari mr sogram femi mr liu welcome to the panel session thank you i mean okay. for so my for first question you. is for mr aliu um i've not seen him i hope he's here um uh, mr liu during the poll session, one of the things we noted is that about 87% of our participants actually attested to the fact that the automated tax initiative have enhanced easier, faster, and cheaper tax administration. So my question is, what steps is FIRS taking to make sure that there are more taxpayers that are brought into the tax net? Because you know, one of the issues that have been raised over the years is that the FIRS keep taxing the same set of people over and over again. Are there plans to bring more people into the tax net, seeing the success of this ease of tax administration as we currently have it? Mr. Lee, over to you, please. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity. Mr. Lee, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Please, please go on. Okay. All right, thank you yes, for this we can opportunity. can hear you. And thank you for having me, and um, good afternoon, all. Um, FRS over the years have been trying to see how to expand the net. It's actually part of its core mandate to see how it's going to expand the tax uh, uh, taxpayer base. And a lot of measures have been taken. Part of it is uh, through the use of uh, automation, which part of it, Mr. Soji the, from West Metro has uh, earlier specified. When you are doing business, all those data has been collected and are, are channeled to the service and to see how we're going to use those information to add the base. And there's also the use of third party uh, intelligence coming from the financial sectors and also from the Nigerian custom and also the use of technology with regards to ver uh, verification uh, from the Nigerian custom service. Now, for all those uh, entities who are trying to import items into the country, uh, you have to use your TRN as a means of a valid uh, identifier. And if you do, that is not a valid or you don't have, a, uh, even if you do, and it's not, you're not active on the system, um, you will not be able to come into, uh, import anything into the country. You have to go and regularize that. Another measure that's being taken is that of the VP, uh, VPP with for those people who are engaged in doing contracts with government. Um, if your tax uh, clearance is not actually validated properly, you will not do that. And many uh, of such measures have been taken actually. All this is being done to actually expand the taxpayer base so that we can uh, uh, 
generate more revenue for the country. And as time goes on, you will see the the, the amount, how the metrics is going to actually uh, climb up. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, I think my next question is for Mr. Shogram. And the question goes, OECD recommends a user-centric approach by tax authorities when developing and introducing automated tax initiatives, right? Now, we are aware that FIRS did hold some various stakeholder workshop when the deployment of the third party software for real-time tax assessment and collection that Mr. Soji Abolari discussed during his presentation were being introduced. But the question is some, you know, taxpayers are yet to respond to this implementation. Are there strategies that have been adopted by FIRS to ensure that this is done? Because if you notice during our um, poll session, one of the things that the participants indicated, in fact, about 51% of them actually said they do not have that software that the FIRS can, you know, integrate with. So what are the strategies that you're going to use to ensure that more taxpayers are able to assess the network? Because it is interesting to see that this is actually easing tax administration in Nigeria. Good morning, all. Good morning. Um, thank you, Aminat, for that wonderful question. Actually, the key, the key driver of the adoption for the adoption of any technology is actually how user friendly it is, Absolutely. how it has been designed to suit and to fit into to, to be fit for use by all, not just by certain section or certain class of taxpayers or users. OECD has just provided a guideline which every um, uh, tax authority who is desirous of de deploying technology for tax administration need to follow in order to ensure that there is um, uh, the technology is accepted by the users and actually provides the needed customer experience in navigating the solution. While FIRS, when FIRS embarked on actually deploying tax promax in particular, because that's what I can actually talk about, we actually looked at uh, how friendly, how easily uh, uh, can a taxpayer or a user navigate our solution based on available uh, ICT infrastructure that we have in Nigeria. There are actually beautiful things that you can do on computer or on the net, but do we have the infrastructure to support most of the features which might make or will make the system, um, what would I say, much more acceptable, much more enjoyable? So currently, the users or the stakeholders, which often that's the name we call every person that is involved in tax administration, we refer to them as stakeholders. Actually, so many stakeholders provided their feedback, including our professional colleagues, KPMG and other the big fives. We always have their support when it comes to feedback as to what is expected in any tax administration solution. We, we actually got those feedbacks from relevant uh, stakeholders and those feedbacks have been accommodated within the available ICT infrastructure that is available in Nigeria and also to FIRS as we speak and we'll keep improving as we get the feedback from our users from our stakeholders to ensure that the rate of um, the rate of resistance towards adoption is minimized thereby leading to greater penetration of automated tax administration in Nigeria. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shogwan. Mr. Debumi, I'll be coming to you next. And again, I would say that for me, I think you're representing taxpayers, right? So I would like to hear from you as the leader of one of the high paying organizations in Nigeria. Can you share with our participants what was your experience and also what are the practical challenges that you faced when you had to you know, integrate your system for this real-time assessment and collection of VAT? What are the things that organizations should have in place and what are the things that they need to take into consideration in ensuring this real-time assessment? Okay, maybe I'll start. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in terms of um, integrations with uh, the FRS, our mobile network operators have not uh, started that yet. However, we are 
we are having engagements and some of the challenges that we have seen or we are putting forward. Some of them uh, Mr. Sojabal already touched on during his presentation, particularly if you look at mobile network operators like uh, MTN, where we deal with the volumes of data, we have concerns around data privacy, data security, particularly because we also have obligations to ensure compliance with uh, requirements for protecting our customer records, our customer data, and the likes. So we're worried about a uh, possible intrusion in terms of in our, in our business processes. We're also concerned that um, when we give these records or what we are concerned about the class of data, we don't have necessarily have full clarity around the sets of data that the service uh, require for the automation and then the collection of VAT, like they've said. We're also concerned about integration and then compatibility with our systems. What infrastructures do we need to do we need to have in place? Would there be uh, and then also the cost, particularly too, because because when you look at the way MNOs work, mobile network operators work, and the kind of service we provide is basically a bit different from the standard services that your hotels and the other ones provide. So we need to also look at in terms of what infrastructure will be required from an MNO's point of view, what cost, and then who bears that cost? Will it be co-shared? Will we get some form of incentives? for because there might be a requirement for certain infrastructure, because if we, we might be having conversations around them, um, having connection into our mediation systems, our billing platforms, and the likes. So those are things that we are worried and concerned about. But I would like to state also that we're having the engagements already, and uh, I, yeah, I, I believe they will yield positive fruits. If you've been following the news, so we're not uh, working the journey alone. We're working with the FRS. We're working with NCC. And the, recently, they both signed, the FRS and the NCC signed the memorandum of, um, of understanding to work together to address some of these are concerns. And we believe that we'll find a meeting point where we get a workable solution. Because ultimately, yes, we want to comply. We will always comply. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for that. And of course, I need to go to Mr. Bolari because one of your potential customers just highlighted the issues that they are worried about when it comes to you know automated solutions. And I know that during your presentation, you did talk about some of the challenges and some of the major concerns that taxpayers may have with you know integrating their system with the FRS. And I think Mr. Odebumi just brought it to four again. But in addition, there's something that you did not address, and that is the issue of cost. You did address the issue of um, compatibility. You addressed the issue of data privacy and also cybersecurity. I think maybe you can share some additional insights with regards to data privacy and you know, cybersecurity, just to give our participants some more comfort with regards to the you know, system. And in addition to that, the cost of bringing these systems to life, who bears the cost and how is it currently being done for the businesses that you have already integrated? Thank you, Mr. Obolari. Okay, so thank you. Um, in terms of compatibility and um, security, for compatibility, um, like I said during the presentation, there's absolutely nothing new that has been introduced to your current system. Um, before FRS came, most organizations had already probably determined the type of software they wanted to use for their accounting processes. And what we are trying to do is to ensure that there is no disruption to your existing processes, which is why we're taking the harder way routes. There are easier ways to do this, um, including um, installation of electronic fiscal devices or what's, you know, uh, third party softwares. However, those, those approaches bring out these issues you're bringing out, which is why we've said, look, you already trust your software vendor. You've probably spent millions of naira investing in this software. And um, because this is the way the world is going, even in Europe where uh, fiscalization and the training invoicing that has, is about 15, 20 years advanced, they are all switching to software fiscalization now. Um, this is a very simple thing. On the FRS side, we have an API and your software just needs to send the data sets. So as Shedman had said that, you know, they don't know the data sets that will be sent. I will speak specifically to our solution at West Metro. And it's public, I shared it earlier on. The data sets that are being shared by your software vendor are very clear. They're just financial data sets. So if you understand how an API works, it's kind of interpret, interpretability. Regardless of the type of software you have, regardless of the hardware that you have, you're already using it, you've already made those investments. 
We don't want you to have any additional cost to that effect because we want your business to move for you to be able to revit to FIRS. However, because your software vendor has to complete your integration on your behalf, if any subject of cost comes up, then that, that comes from the relationship between you and your software vendor. Let's give an example. If you have a software vendor that you have not decided to pay support for a while, if you do come down and say, well, I want you to provide FRS interface for me, chances are because you don't have a support contract with your software vendor, he's going to tell you to pay him. Some other software vendors will look at it and say, okay, I'm doing this on your behalf. I'm providing a level of insurance, doing the development and whatnot on your behalf. So therefore, I will charge you a license fee for this. We've experienced this. And what we've done in, the, in, in such situations is to mediate. Because we are in the middle between FIRS and the taxpayer, we understand the problems of FIRS, and we also understand the problems that the taxpayer has. So we have to find a very beautiful middle ground. And that's what we've done to say, okay, um, it's a software vendor. How do we go about this? You can't, I mean, this is not supposed to come at any cost to the, to the customer. So you can't charge a license fee. But the customer does also want FIRS in their data center. They don't want any FIRS person to touch their systems. Somebody must touch the system. So it's either you have the in-house expertise or you use your software vendor who you already trust. He's the one that knows the code. He's the one that provided the system. Now, to go to the point of data privacy and security, again, in actual fact, this actually helps to improve that. And I'll give you an example. In Nigeria today, we have a lot of people using fake softwares. Mm. What they don't understand is that when I build a software, I build the necessary things to kind of lock it up so that when I give you a license key, it's only when you can open it up. Now you've got to get this big software because you don't want to pay Oracle their money. That module that I use to secure it is now what is called a crack. So if you recall, if you try to um, replace your Microsoft Office, the other ones before we went through 65, you will see that your antivirus will give you a pop-up that these files are strange to this system. Somebody somewhere in the world has written a code and give you and told you that the software that is worth $10,000 is free. You have taken the code because you don't want to pay the software vendor. You are bringing and the one introducing security threats to your environment. Whereas if you have to do the software integration with FIRS, you can't go and get that integration from the third party in the black market. You need to talk to the original software vendor. And I'll give an example. The number of hotels in Nigeria are suffering this today. You want to use a five-star software, but you don't want to pay the cost of a five-star software. So you go and give a third party to help you work it. Now that FIRS has said you must integrate, you have to go back to the origins of the software. The, the, the owner of the software has gone to FIRS. He has completed the integration as required by him. And he's able to say, look, anybody using my software, just go to my software store, download the plugin and configure it, and you're good to go. So if you are, if we're talking about security, right, I believe strongly that um, in terms of data privacy, these kind of issues will continue to help us streamline our system in Nigeria. In where they go, all you just needed to do was go to computer village, buy a CD, install it, and you're going. But things have things have changed now. All right. So you can it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bolari, for those additional insights. Um, Femi, I'll come to you quickly, and I would also like to hear your thoughts on some of the challenges that Mr. Odebumi has highlighted. And in addition to that, I would like you to also tell us, what do you consider to be the features of an automation-ready tax function? Femi, over to you, please. Okay, thank you very much, Aminat. And um, the conversations that have happened, uh, or the conversations that have uh, taken place so far, especially from Shergon, uh, from Soji, and from the FRS team, have actually been interesting ones. <clears throat> I, I think I would like to start by commending the FRS, really, uh, in terms of the engagements that they've had um, in trying to get the taxpayers on board. I remember when this automated uh, VAT collection or VAT assessment and collection was going to start, there was a lot of um, you know, conversation around how should this be implemented. There was initial thinking about having a fiscal um, system that would connect to ERPs and then be able to extract and taxpayers pushed against that. And um, if you listen to Soji, you see that there's been evolution in terms of what is being introduced. Now they're talking about APIs, which is consistent with what is um, um, applicable in other in other jurisdictions. And Shegun did mention that even in terms of 
deploying this for the tel for the telcos. Uh, there are ongoing engagements between the FRS, the NCC, and the taxpayers. And I think that is the starting point for any automation initiative, just like you mentioned about the OECD uh, recommendations, that you must have a, a user-centric development. Uh, you can develop some technology initiatives in isolation and just deploy and expect people to then adopt. Uh, to then adopt. Uh, that's where technology adoption usually fails the most. So having that engagement is definitely important. Uh, uh, when Soji was talking, he, he mentioned some of the examples coming from the hotels. And if you listen to the complaints from 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 that sec from the sector, uh, you will find out that just a bit more a bit more engagement in terms of trying to understand you know what the sector requires and how we can work around that um, would definitely would have helped in terms of resolving some of the concerns. Uh, it is important to mention also that this initiative is here to stay. And I think, Aminat, you did mention that at the start, the laws have been passed. Um, and what that means that taxpayers generally will have to comply uh, is how to comply that they then need to think around. Um, some of the issues which Shegun did mention it, do they have the necessary technology? Have you adopted the, the correct version of the ERP, for, for, I mean, for, for example? You can't buy um, Oracle off the shelf and expect it to work now with a system that the FRS is definitely going to deploy. Um, so you have spoken well about that. So you need to ensure that you have the right technology tools. You need to ensure that you have the right you know, systems. The, your, your, your ERP is generating the right uh, quality of data. One thing I usually like to say is once you have the opportunity to look at your data and your technology, then it may provide grounds for you to look at the tax function as, as a whole. Uh, we then goes into the second point of your question that, you know, what are the features of a technology-ready tax, tax function, right? Um, and it's not just about having the right technology and having the right quality of data, but you also need to look at the quality of your people, right? You, if you have the technology, but you don't have the people to understand or even operate. So you need to have people that are properly skilled. You need to have the right processes in place. You need to ensure that in terms of the work your people do, um, they are not overwhelmed with all the manual things. So a lot of automation will have to come into play. Uh, we ran a poll about you know, having the governance, that's a risk policy, the governance, all of that has to be in place for you to then ensure that your tax function is ready to, you know, to, to connect and to be up to date in terms of what the FRC is trying to do. So it will be uh, you know, limiting for this transition to happen, it may then be, you know, take, taking a very narrow view for tax for companies to just focus on, you know, technology and data and then believe that every other thing is fine. It may be an opportunity for you to look at the tax function as a whole and see, you know, what are the complementary things that need to be done to ensure that we have a holistic um, review and be prepared for the FRS automation. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much, Femi. It's interesting how fast as time, time goes when we're having conversations of this nature. But I think before I round up, it would be very good to hear from Mr. Lee. And I think a lot of participants would be interested in this question. And the question is about the FIRS's Tax Pro Max uh, portal. One of the um, interesting debates that we have currently is whether the FIRS Tax Pro Max portal is a computational tool. So we'd like to hear your views about this. Is it a computational tool or is it a tax compliance tool? That's one. And then the other question is about what happens in the position where there is a difference in the interpretation between the FIRS and the taxpayer. Is the tax pro max flexible enough to accommodate this position or taxpayers just have to file their tax returns based on the FIRS's position as configured on the system. Mr. Lee, over to you, please. All right, thank you very much. As you may be aware, taxation is a practical process governed by statutory. This notion of tax pro max computing the taxes due for taxpayer is correct. Uh, it is a rule of automation. People appear to be challenging this because we are using the self-assessment uh, regime. The self-assessment regime requires a taxpayer to provide information. However, the application of important legislation for the computation, which some people may be unaware of, has been automated to guide all. For example, if a legislation stipulates 
that you can only utilize a certain fraction of your capital uh, of your capital uh, assess, uh, allowances. Because you are in a specific business line of uh, this, the system will assist you to compute and apply the accurate uh, the accurate position of the law. Let's say for those who are in manufacturing, it allows you to uh, accommodate all your capital allowance for that uh, that you have that is available. Now, for those in uh, in uh, in other business line, it's not they have it's been. Uh, uh, actually uh, co control to say, okay, you can only use two thought or you can use this fraction of uh, this. And for each particular asset, it has a particular uh, uh, um, percentage being used. So uh, let me give you this uh, hypothesis now. Uh, if uh, by the law, for you to recognize accounting profit, the law says uh, it's revenue minus expense. This is a basic uh, arithmetic and the system is uh, coded accordingly. But finally, if a taxpayer desire, uh, decide to say, okay, I'm not going to use uh, revenue minus expense, uh, minus expense to uh, come about its accounting profit, it's, there's no way it's applicable in that way. So what the system does is it's, the taxpayers is responsible for supplying the information. Now, when you supply the information, the system is going to help you to do the mathematical accuracy. This is even done even during the manual uh, during the manual uh, filing, whereby we have a uh, text reviews. Because when you bring it in, this text reviews, what they do is to check the mathematical accuracy of your competition, not changing the data you have brought. Self-assessment is you bringing the information, not anybody going to your books to say, this is your information. No, you decide to present this information to us, so this is your self-assessment. Now, with regards to the application of the law, with regards to the competition, to say one plus one minus that minus this, this is standard. So you cannot go against what the law has said and what we have, uh, what, are the, uh, the, what the law has said or what you have said. So we have all been guided or we are guided by the law to be able to compute to a logical conclusion. Uh, it's a time I think when we started this, we went to one of the one of the leading banks in Nigeria, and to our surprise, we went there to assist them to see how this uh, system is going to handle their assessment. It was computed to the last cobble. What they did manual was what we find online. So it's it's actually if you follow the law, you will actually be guided. Like uh, last one before I pick up uh, stop on this. You can see people can buy uh, a particular asset and they might decide to use 50, 20, 20 for the remaining. When the law did not say it's 50, the law might say 25, 20, 20. So you see the application is, is different. So um, mostly uh, that is where the conflict comes from to say okay. this or that. So the tax code does not go to get information from anywhere to say this is the, your tax. No, you supply it being self assessed But what tax code assists you to do is to do the arithmetics. Okay, thank you so much for that um, clarification. And at this junction, I think we've come to the end of the panel session. I believe our participants are itching to ask you their own questions. So I will turn it over to um, Chinyere, who would guide that session accordingly. Chinyere, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Aminat, for that session. And thank you to all the panelists. Um, so much has been said, and there is so much takeaway from that session. For me, from all that has been said, in one thing it stands out. Auto tax automation has come to stay, and the question is, are we ready? And um, we are we equipped for this process? And that is one of the things we'll be doing in, our, in the upcoming session, where we'll be talking about some of the ways that KPMG can assist um, taxpayers in this regard. So join me as I welcome IKHQN, Associate Director in Tax Division of KPMG Nigeria. IK, you're welcome. Thank you, Chinyer. Um, Please confirm that you can hear and see me. I can hear you, IK. Okay, great. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, and I believe some people are in Nigeria, so I'll say good morning. And for those of us outside Nigeria, good day. Uh, so you're all welcome to this session. Uh, please, could you move the slides? Thank you. Okay. So um, the beginning part of my slides is a bit, um, I, I wouldn't dwell on it because it seems like a whole lot of the uh, 
panelists and presenters that have spoken before me have already talked about this. So I wouldn't want to dwell about uh, dwell on you know the history of what FRS have done in the past few years. But I think um, you know what is important is that this has come to stay, and we really need to get ready for those of us that are not ready yet. It was quite interesting, you know, to look at uh, the some of the statistics. You know, when people put up, you know, how ready they are uh, in respect of how uh, the automation that FRS is doing. And I think uh, it's quite instructive, you know, for those of us that are not ready to realize that, you know, there is actually penalty if you are not compliant uh, by the time FRS comes to you. So it's, it's really important that you get up to speed. Uh, please, could you move to the next slide? And I mean, this slide just talks about what has happened uh, in the past few years. So I wouldn't dwell here as well. Uh, go to the next slide. Okay, I think here, maybe one of the few things I should talk about, you know, what FRS is doing is quite innovative and new, but it's not new all around the world. You know, some people have actually experienced this. And like you have heard here as well, some industries have already, you know, started complying. And some of the key challenges that you know, these people that have already started complying that we've realized while discussing with them, you know, are the things that we've tried to state here. For instance, uh, one of the key issues that have typically come out is with respect to the mapping, account mapping. You know, if you do not properly map your account, that is one of the issues that you would have with respect to the kind of information that you would then have to provide to the FIRS. And you know how it is, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you are not able to provide the right information, then obviously the FRS would compute with whatever you've provided to them and it wouldn't be at that state that, you know, you would then try to start uh, resolving the issue. So it's better you get it right the first time. Uh, there is issue around uh, data, if it's inaccurate, um, you would need to do a whole lot of cleansing at this point. So I, this is, you know, an area that we actually have seen that you know people are trying to get their acts together, cleanse their data to make sure that you know they give the right data to the FRS when they come. Um, and if you don't do that, you would have issues uh, with respect to uh, reconciliations. You would have you would have to go through a painstaking process trying to reconcile uh, what the liabilities that is being determined vis-a-vis -vis what you think your liabilities should be. Uh, so that is an issue we've also seen. Uh, across the people that have already started doing this. Um, and then, you know, something like uh, what uh, Mr. Odebumi has already, you know, hinted about cybersecurity issues. Um, and I, I mean, I, I also heard Mr. Bolarin address and say what the FRS is doing in this regard, but this is one of the things that we have seen uh, some of the people that have tried to comply note as one of their main issues. Could you go to the next slide, please? So how can KPMG assist you, you know, to, you know, sort these issues? What we've tried to do here is to segment the solution that we typically render to people that are going through this, okay? Um, and we've tried to put it into three different stages. One is implementation readiness assessments, helping you get ready. There are different things that uh, KPMG could assist you in this regard. Uh, we could look at the infrastructure that you already have on ground. Is it adequate? Is it effective? Is, will it help you achieve what you are trying to achieve? Uh, we also, we can look at the chart of accounts, look at the quality of data that you are bringing out. Does it align with what is expected of you? Uh, we could also assist you if, for instance, for any reason, you are not ready to you know, meet up with this timeline. Build a case to discuss with the FIRS on how you know the the amount of time that you should be given to enable you meet up with this timeline and of course i've talked about the cyber security issues we could do some assurance assessment you know in this regard so these are some of the things that you do at the early stage when you are trying to ensure that you are ready before frs comes in and then at the level of you know implementation phase there are some services that we would help you uh, that we could render to you at, the, at that stage. For instance, we could help you with uh, your ERP selection if you don't have already, but if you do have, we could look at you know, the efficiency and effectiveness of what you have vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the configuration that FRS 
uh, would require. And then, of, of course, we could assist with uh, API integration where necessary and engagement with FRS third party software. This is uh, the implementation phase. But then we also recognize that subsequent to this, there would be times FRS would have to come back to reconfirm that the information that you've provided to them is actually aligns with what they expect from you. Um, as you will recall, in the regular tax filing, you submit based on self-assessment, but then subsequently FRS would come back for an audit to reconfirm the information you've provided. So at that stage, which what we've called here is uh, post-implementation phase, uh, we could help you do a post-implementation, uh, post-assessment uh, reconciliation with what FRS is presenting vis-a-vis -vis what you previously presented at the implementation phase and resolve any queries that comes up at that point. We could also provide support or necessary technology processes, you know, updates that may be required by you, you know, to ensure uh, efficiency in this process. And we could also provide support on systems audits that may be conducted by the FRS. But, you know, what we've tried to put on the previous slide, no, move, move ahead. What we've tried to put, you know, on the previous slide is, you know, uh, the kind of things we could do to help you, uh, to support you during this uh, FRS automation. However, there are all that services that we typically render to companies. And this is from experience. Once we, you've realized that you're having issues with your data and with your technology, there's a likelihood that you may also need to look at your other support system, the tax function as a whole. Please, could you go to the next slide? The tax function as a whole. So there are different things that we could do. I see that we are running against time already because some of the sessions have you know, gone beyond what it is. But you know, what we've tried to do here is to highlight some of those things that KPMG can help you do besides supporting you during your uh, automation uh, implementation phase. So there's all the governance part and there's a list of things uh, that we could do. There's uh, compliance and of course there's technology. I already saw in some of the questions, people asking how can technology help? There are things that we could do for you uh, uh, processes we could help you automate, for instance, that we think you know would help you uh, meet up with the tax functions for the future. So uh, next slide, please. I will stop here, but uh, it's just because of want of time. However, please feel free to reach out to any of us here. Uh, we would be happy to provide additional clarification or support as you may need it. So I'll stop here and wait for any further questions that you know may come up. Thank you. Thank you very much, IK, for that presentation. And like IK said, please feel free to contact any of us on the screen here. I'll be very much glad to um, take the conversation forward. OK, um, sincerely, we apologize that we are running behind time. Um, some of uh, some sessions, you know, took uh, one minute here, two minutes here, and overall we are behind time. We sincerely apologize and we'll try to hasten up. Um, we we'll don't want to close the session without addressing the questions that we have in the Q and A box. So far, some of the questions have been addressed, but we know that there are still some that are lingering. And so I will invite um, Elizabeth Olahere. Our Associate Director in our task division in KPMG Nigeria to please take some of the questions and the panelists are also waiting to address them. Lizzie, you're welcome. Thank you, Chinere. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to our distinguished guest, our panelists, um, for staying this long. Um, we've overshoot on time a bit, but we'll quickly take the questions because um, there's no point us running this session without answering some, or at least trying to cure some of your curiosity. Um, so some of your questions have already been answered. We'll be focusing mostly on the open questions. Um, I'll be taking Femi's question. He's asked that on tax pro max, it was observed that details of remitted withholding tax could not be downloaded into Excel. Is there anything FRS is going to do on this? I'll direct this to uh, Mr. Um, Billiamin, but I would give you two questions that are similar. So there's um, a lot of questions that have come through on um, denomination. So um, people are asking, participants or attendees are asking that Naira has been automated, but not USD or um, pounds in terms of their transactions on tax max. So Mr. Billiamin, if you're still there, could you answer that question? 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, with regards to the first question from Mr. Femi, yeah, um, I believe that has been addressed. You can actually download um, your withholding credit notes, not even only your withholding credit notes. You can also do that uh, to your ledgers because we have, I think we have about four to five ledgers on the system that we're controlling. We have the central where you have your, uh, your payments and we have the loss relief account, the withholding account, the capital allowance account, and the withholding account. All this, I believe, can be uh, downloaded. And if you believe you cannot, I think we will do a short video and put on our website so that you can be able to get that and see how it's been done. Uh, secondly, with regards to the USD uh, payment, which regards uh, cross-border payment, is actually uh, something um, the management are seriously um trying to see that it's been implemented in no distance time so please bear with us for that but uh, this will also be uh, included in no distance time thank you okay thank you for that um another question that has been asked is i believe that more compliant more compliant a company is the more the company is taxed my observation is that companies in the cities are taxed more than companies not in the city. The company that is not in the city can evade tax without any repercussion. I think essentially uh, this is something that had been addressed already by Mr. Billiamin or um, by Amina during the panel session where we're talking about the informal sector. You know, there have been a lot of initiatives about how you get the informal sector, sec um, sector into the tax net through technology. So I think there's a lot of focus on that. Uh, Mr. Billiamin gave some initiatives about how you, for you to import, you need your tax identification number. So there's a lot of initiatives to also bring in the informal sector. Now, um, on the tax pro max again, this is going to Mr. Mbani. Um, electricity, electricity distribution companies, they're asking that there's the issue of the VAT gap. Um, especially with respect to expected revenue, if there's a shortfall in that gap between expected revenue and the actual, and what's going to happen in that situation. Uh, Mr. Mbami, Mr. Mbami, also to you, um, the taxpayer is saying they want your details. I'm sure you'll be able to share that. And then if we take one other question to you, um, Mr. Adigbe is asking, while commending the automation drive by the FRS, especially under the current administration. I wish to know the current ratio of taxpayer to staff in FRS and how staff base has impacted or collaborated the use of technology. So Mr. Mbami, over to you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, regarding the tax uh, VAT gap on the electricity distribution companies, it's actually a complex um, issue currently in Nigeria because of the transition that most of the electricity distribution companies are passing through. Because most of these electricity distribution companies are actually operating under a special purpose vehicle, SPVs, whereby even the, the taxes or the payment for electricity consumed by customers is not actually going to the electricity distribution companies directly. There is a company that has been set up uh, to manage their revenue. And it's this particular company that actually remit the VAT. So you could see the operator of the business is different from the person that manages his finances. So there is actually a very huge gap there. And onto a government, it's able to transit from actually managing, technically managing these electricity distribution companies via the special purpose vehicles, it will be difficult for us to actually close the gap since the revenue does not go directly to the electricity distribution companies. It will be very difficult for us to actually have access and close that gap. And I know each of the respective electricity distribution companies have a time frame within which government is to recoup its investment in those companies. And I know once they are independent to run like every other private business, that gap will surely be closed because we can directly have access to their finances as every other average taxpayer. That being said, I would say, sure, in no time we can be able to close that gap in the uh, electricity dis distribution companies. For 
Uh, the second question from, um, I'm trying to get the second question, please. Adipe. Adipe. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm trying to get the question up. And then it came. Okay. While commending automation drive by the FIR, especially the current tax administration, the ratio of taxpayers to staff. Currently, if you look at Tax Pro or whosoever is actually has been migrated to Tax Pro Max, you see that the name and the phone number of your tax admin or your tax officer is displayed on your account. This essentially is expected that you should be able to have some level of relationship in managing your tax affairs with the client. Currently, taxpayers that have migrated on the system is running around 600,000 on Tax Pro Max. And each of these taxpayers have been assigned a tax admin officer. And our staff strength as we speak is around, around 11,000. And out of these 11,000, those that are core tax officers are actually around 10,000. So you can see definitely if you distribute this number of migrated taxpayers, migrated taxpayers, these are taxpayers that have been fiscalized, let me put it so, who are contributing actively to the tax revenue. If you distribute them across the 10,000 staff, you see that actually, averagely, each of our staff have around 200 taxpayers to himself to monitor their compliance, to monitor their VAT, both consumption tax and income taxes. So, and readily their phone numbers are displayed, their emails are displayed in each taxpayer's account. It's not like before when we're running the manual environment whereby you don't even know who your tax officer is. You don't have contact with him. Whenever you need anything, you need to go to the office. With the digitized tax administration system, you have access to your tax officer and your tax officer also have access to you, must have your phone number and your email through which you can effectively communicate. And our collaboration with technology has also translated to greater collection and also uh, uh, a taxpayer engagement or customer satisfaction in our service delivery. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, Mr. Mbami. Um, so we'll be running up on questions, but we just have a couple more that we should just go through. I will be um, directing this again to you, Mr. Mbami, just very quickly. Um, taxpayers want to know, um, will there be a test environment before the ERP integrated system is launched or would, before the ERP integration, as we may like to test first yeah. before full deployment for security comfort reasons. Um, before you go ahead, I would speak again about security because quite a couple of the questions have um, been lingering on data privacy. I think Saji have tried to address it. Uh, Mr. Billiamin and yourself have addressed it. If you could also um, chip in a bit because of Adinike's question on the concern of cost implication and data privacy. Okay. So the first question is um, a test environment, like a pilot study, um, possibly for the um, MNOs. The... Thank you so much. Uh, currently, for the deployment of the uh, automated tax administration solution, particularly for the VAT, which we're about to actually go into, um, by appointment of MTN banks and um, all all financial institutions, particularly banks, to actually act on this behalf. The service has actually put in resources to see that proper onboarding is done for all taxpayers. The test environment will not be available, let me put it so, because the resources needed to actually put it in place now is not available, but before we deploy. Key thing there is we want to start first then the resources to actually put these resources in place would actually be provided. And in no distant time, taxpayers will have access to actually a test environment where they can self-drive, self-test, and be familiar with our solution before onboarding to the life environment. Currently, what we have or what we have deployed basically is actually computer-assisted tax administration solution. We are actually here to, get, to go to the automated. In the automated, you know, everything is actually independently done by systems via integration. So before we go to the fully automated tax administration uh, system, 
Definitely a test environment will be available, support uh, resources will be made available to ensure that uh, there would be seamless onboarding for everyone. And as Mr. Soji had actually said, we are actually uh, uh, um, grouping our taxpayers. We're starting with the large taxpayers who already have an existing ERP, which can easily be integrated to our solution. This class of taxpayers actually are far ahead of us. We don't need to mince word about it. And the cost of actually deploying this solution is even much more to our own site, to FRS site, than even to the, these bigger taxpayers. But be it as it may, for the smaller taxpayers, we would actually make resources available to do that. For data security, it's a global, it's a global drive. Apart from the global non-disclosure requirement, we also have our own in Nigeria NDPR, which of course, before TaxPro was even deployed, we had to submit it to the Nigeria Information Technology Development Agency, which is in charge of certifying any solution, whether it's fit for use in Nigeria. And this certification that NIDA gives includes how the design, that's the architecture, the security, and conformity with global standards. And TaxPro was actually subjected to that and it passed before it was deployed. So I want to assure taxpayers, whatever information or integration that you have with us, your data is secured with us. Your resources are protected by us. At no point since we deployed TaxPro, have we had any case of data breach from the current taxpayers that flocked to our system, including government agencies, including banks that would flock or they flocked to our, through our API. So I want to assure taxpayers that issue of data security is taken serious, not just by FRS, Nigeria is taking it serious and our footprint regarding data security is seen all over. Because I'll tell you, IMF just uh, uh, last December issued their own report regarding tax pro, and it was quite impressive to see that what we deployed just out of um, exigencies or out of necessity in 2020 because of COVID-19 can actually receive such an accolade and certification and confirmation that yes, we've done the right things which will support tax administration in Nigeria. So for data security, I assure you, we Soji West Metro, which of course we're using them as our partners because we don't have the in-house capacity as we speak. That's why we look for reputable partners who have credentials regarding data security to engage them, to help us get this data for tax administration. But time will come that will actually plug directly to your system and system to system. You don't need to come to our office to get your assessment or to pay your taxes. At the end of every tax season, the system will present your financial statement, present your taxes payable. All you need to do is to agree, pay and move on. So that's where we're looking at, at you know, towards for the automated tax administration solution, where human intervention is minimized to its barest minimum. And every business is visible, you know, to the tax administration authority. It means every aspect of your business, FIRS has access to it. As transactions are happening, taxes are deducted and paid automatically without waiting for you to come and tell us what you're doing. We'll tell you what you're doing in no distant time. And I assure you, we are ready for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Billiamin, for that very robust um, response. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. We're significantly behind time now. So we want to keep to our promise. Um, at this point, we'll have to bring the um, question and answers to a close temporarily. We will engage you further and we would collate all these questions and respond to them. But in the meantime, we want to say thank you very much for participating in the polls, for participating in the questions and answer sessions and for staying till the end of the session. Um, indeed, this is very interesting times and technology will be a key driver. So the interest is very valid and we expect to see a lot of transformation in our businesses as we align our tax practice with the global blessed practice. At this point, I'll hand over to Chinyere to continue with the program. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Lizzie, for that um, session. Um, I believe we're able to address a good number of them. And like Lizzie said, the others will also be addressed in the comment section. All right, thank you so very much. At this point, we want to bring the session to a close. Please join me as I welcome Ike Chuku as he takes the vote of thanks. Okay, wow. That was a very insightful session we just had. Um, and I deem it uh, a great honor to propose the vote of thanks to all who have contributed in one way or the other to make this uh, event a very, in my view, successful event. So first of all, um, I'd like to propose a hearty vote of thanks to the management um, of KPMG, the tax partners, uh, Wale Ajayi and the other tax partners, you know, for taking the initiative to, you know, sensitize taxpayers on the future of tax in Nigeria. Um, I would also like to extend uh, thanks to our distinguished panelists, um, Mrs. Chiaka Ben Obi, who is leading tax transformation in FIRS, digital uh, tax transformation in FIRS, and um, Mr. Uh, uh, Soji Abolarin uh, also as well. I mean, the interesting and thought-provoking presentations that you've made uh, sets pace for the, for the entire event, um, and I'm sure our participants are grateful for that. I would also like to thank um, our other panelists, um, the, uh, our very own TR partner, Femi Babem, um, and the other panelists, Mr. Odebumi, and the FRS um, uh, digital uh, gurus that joined us, Mr. Mbami Shogwam and uh, Mr. Bilia Minu Aliyu. I mean, thank you very much for you know, gracing this occasion and for the insightful uh, sessions that you had. I would also want to extend uh, our thanks to my colleagues, some of whom you've seen, you know, that have, you know, worked here like Chinyere, who is one of the uh, hosts. Um, and there are a whole lot of others that are behind the scene whom we haven't seen. Uh, somebody like David Dofara um, and Victor uh, Temitokwaya can be. Thank you very much for your support. And then we would also want to, we are, of course, we are forever indebted to our participants, some of whom are our clients, and we know how difficult it is to rearrange your calendars and to make our time to attend these sessions. But you did grace us, you know, grace this occasion with your time, and we really do appreciate that. Thank you. And please, like we mentioned during the sessions, if you do have any challenge with tax technology, or any issue around your tax, we are always available for you to discuss this. Uh, don't worry, it wouldn't be at a fee for that initial discussion. Uh, we'll be happy to you know, talk to you anytime on that. Um, to my other wonderful colleagues who have joined this session, thank you as well. The contributions you made while we were preparing to uh, host this webinar are all appreciated. And finally, to any other person that we haven't really mentioned here, but who have participated in one way or the other to make this event a success. We thank you very much. And we would say thank you, God bless, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Geopolitical tax is being reimagined for that has changed dramatically. Geopolitical shifts, technological innovation, globalization, new business and consumer demands. These trends are transforming the way tax leaders are thinking about tax. And businesses tell us they spend more on annual tax compliance than on their annual audit. The old country-by-country tax-by-tax approach no longer works. Businesses increasingly want a strategic relationship with a partner 
who can travel the journey with them to a new target operating model for their tax and finance functions. A model that is digital, global, efficient and effective in unlocking strategic value. Welcome to Tax Reimagined, a new framework which brings together our tax knowledge and transformation skills, our leading technologies and our expertise in delivery across the world to meet the new demands businesses face. This is not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's about deploying skilled solution architects that can work with you to design, implement and continuously improve the target operating model and aligns your tax department's vision and strategy with the broader business objectives from in-house automation to outsourced managed service solutions. This teamwork is a platform for reimagining the future of tax. KPMG is investing collectively and is committed to innovation and developing our suite of tax technology solutions. Training 10,000 of our tax professionals to become experts in technology and solution architecture, building best-in-class regional delivery centers and consistent global delivery standards. By acting collectively and acting now, the future of tax is here.